Um, all right, so quick motivation. I'm gonna try to get through this quickly because you know we want to get to some of the numbers. Um, so real quickly, you know, why should you guys care about headline changes? Well, um, generally speaking, headlines are actually, I think, are pretty important. Um, headlines shape, you know, what headlines are listed, draw readers and, and determine which articles we actually read. So the headlines actually has a lot to do with how people consume news. Now, there's a, a really neat social psychology literature that also points out that headlines also shape um, how people remember articles. That, for example, um, f um, errors in headlines tend to lead people to remember that error in terms of the substance of the article. So it, it has important effects on you know, what, how people, um, what people are taking away from an article. And then finally, there's these kind of comical um, images at the top, at least one or two of those I, I imagine are, are familiar to, to many of you. Um, some newspapers, their entire identity is shaped around um, headlines. The New York Post, which is my favorite newspaper in New York, uh, is probably most well known for this. This is a book that Tommy, I don't think is happy that I, I, I reference, but it's a collection of New York Post headlines and they're, they're pretty humorous. Okay, um, it's also worth pointing out that um, while we're focusing on the New York Times and a little on the Wall Street Journal, headline changes are something that most or all newspapers employ as part of their digital arsenal at this point. So there's a company called Chartbeat it's a U.S. Canadian company that we've interacted with a little bit, and um, they've told us that they work with 700 different uh, newspapers, which include, you know, almost all the big U.S. publishers, and they have clients in 68 countries, and they help those newspapers both change headlines and run A-B tests, but even do things like running A-B tests on images and lots of other kinds of things. Now, two, two small, two items I want to mention about the headline changes I think are, are worth noting. One is headline changes, as I'll talk a tiny bit on the next slide about, I'm going to mostly skip the next slide, I think, is largely about newspaper learning about um, readers, readers' uh, preferences. And that kind of learning is best done at scale. So this is going to be kind of a novel reason why we might expect to see more consolidation in newspapers, namely, if you want to learn in a, in a news environment, well, news stories have a very short shelf life. So the faster you learn, the better. Well, the New York Times, because they have millions of viewers, can learn a lot uh, about their viewers much more quickly than, say, my local newspaper, the Winston-Salem Journal, which I'm sure you've never heard of, because they don't have very many readers. So this is going to be an, another mechanism, I think, to promote consolidation. Another uh, item I want to point out, this is a little polemical, so I don't want to emphasize it too much, but it is a little weird where you have these newspapers of record that are changing aspects of stories after they've been printed. In other words, this is, you know, if you want to push this very hard, is something you might expect to see in 1984. The one thing I want to mention is Aside from Tommy and my data, it would be almost impossible for any of you guys to know that a headline change has actually happened. The New York Times does not tell you that they change headline changes anywhere on a on a printed article on a on a online article. Um, again, I I don't want to emphasize this other uh, slide too much because I want to get to the actual numbers. But the the short end is why. You know, we expect that newspapers are doing these headline changes to learn, to learn about their readers, either to learn about, you know, from an economic perspective, what drives, what kind of headlines drives people to, to engage with an article. Or, you know, if we think, you know, coming back, harking back to that quote from President Trump, if we think the newspapers are changing headlines for ideological purposes, maybe they're learning about um the ideological biases of or ideological preferences of their readers, um, but headline changes are a tool are, are a tool for, for for getting at that. Okay, so anyway, let me let me now actually start telling you a little bit about you know the data we have and some of our results. And again, uh, let me ask any questions on anything. Okay. Um, so a little bit about our data. So the New York Times, what we what we do to collect our data 
is this is like a little image of our um, our scraper program at work. We scrape the New York Times homepage, like nyt.com, every minute. So every minute, our scraper goes and collects all the articles that are on the homepage. Uh, originally, when we were running, it was every or when the program was being run, it was every five minutes. Uh, but more recently, as I said, every minute. Now, for uh, reasons that I'll talk about in a second, we have to do some kind of technological things to kind of trick their server um, into not knowing that we're consistently pinging and banging on their server a lot. I'll, I'll get back to these, um, these two bolts right here in a second. So what we're doing is in each run, we're collecting all the, the headlines that are and, and stories that are there. And then we take for each one of those articles, we can go to the New York Times API, which they very nicely provide and collect a lot of information about the article. We can collect uh, the full story, an abstract of the story, the section, the articles in the writer, a bunch of other stuff as well. The uh, one thing that's particularly helpful for what we want to do is each one of these articles has a unique ID. So we can track an article over time as long as it's on the New York Times um, homepage. And so we can then try to figure out from our data whether the New York Times is changing their headlines. And again, there's these two kinds of headlines. The first is an A-B test, which I'll, I'll talk a tiny bit more about in a second. We'll define an A-B test as saying there's at least uh, two headline changes within an hour, or we'll sometimes see an immediate headline change where there's a, a literally a switch from one headline to another that's permanent. Now, there's a important kind of data uh, or observational issue with the A-B test, namely, um, so the way A-B tests work is you go to the site, you're randomly given either the original headline A or a new headline B. Now, which bin you're sorted into is you, as best as I, we're understanding the computer science literature is usually done in one of two ways. It's based on the cookie that you get when you go to a, a site and it might be based on the user agent that you're, you're using. So what we have to do is make sure we don't accept cookies when we scrape this stuff and we spoof our user agents when we go. Um, so each time, every minute when we rescrape the New York Times, the New York Times thinks, oh, we're a totally different user each time. Now, um, this next part here, I just, I don't wanna dwell on very much, but is worth kind of just mentioning. We face kind of an important observational issue. Most of the time when people study A-B tests, they are doing this from the perspective of the experimenter, from like the newspaper or from a company, we're the experimenting. And the challenge for us is that while an ideal A-B test is one where, you know, you're seeing headline A, then headline B, et cetera, we don't get to choose that. Like we might, when we go to the New York Times, consistently be given headline A many times or headline B many times. So it's possible given the way we're collecting our data, we might actually miss an A-B test. We might just have bad luck and um, consistently get headline A. It turns out, and there's a, an appendix in the paper, uh, quantitatively, uh, this is not going to be an issue for us because we scrape the data frequently enough that we're not going to always get stuck in one bin or the other. But if this is something, if you're interested in some of these kind of technical issues, which are are pretty important, there's a there's an appendix that that gets into that. Okay, now finally, let's get into some data. Twenty minutes into into the talk, so this table we're going to see a version of a couple times in the talk is a is a set of summary statistics. And so the way this table is organized is, ah, oh, good, my pen is working. The, there's four columns. And the last column is gonna be all the articles that we are tracking. And you can see the last row is the sample size and we're tracking about 35,000 articles. Uh, this is this uh, January, 2021 to April, 2022 period. The first three columns then split that sample up into articles that have A-B tests, articles that have an immediate headline change and the remaining ones that get no headline changes. And if you just compare the sample sizes, you can see of that 35,000, about 10% get both either an A-B test on their headlines or an immediate headline change. Okay, so that's the uh, source of this, about 20% of the articles get a headline change. 
What the uh, different rows show you is then uh, uh, some real basic information about these articles. And so it shows you, for example, the first row is how long does an article stay on the homepage? And you can compare the number. So a typical article is it stays on the homepage about 17 hours. An article that gets either an A-B test or an immediate headline change, it stays on the homepage a little bit longer. So these are articles that are, you know, for various reasons, more, um, uh, more topical. The second and third row, we do a very standard, uh, we use a very standard sentiment algorithm analysis where we just say, is a headline relatively positive or relatively negative in, in, its, in the language that it uses? And we can see for, e well, for the headline itself, headlines, uh, articles that get a headline change are slightly more negative than ones than a typical article. And then finally, the last three rows show you the, um, uh, basically what kind of article is this? Is it a hard news article? Is it an, an op-ed type article? Or is it everything else? So like if you're a New York Times reader, this is like the science, style, arts, all that other stuff. And you can see that relative to the overall sample, the articles that get either an A-B test or, a, or an immediate headline change are more likely to be news, more likely to be opinion, and therefore kind of as a, you know, since articles have to be one of these three types, are less likely to be the kind of soft, uh, soft news articles. So the main, you know, takeaway from this table is that articles that get headline changes uh, are not, um, are, well, headline changes are common, and articles that get headline changes are not the same as all the other articles. Okay, this figure, which I'll uh, kind of skip over, but just briefly worth noting, is a histogram of how long articles stay on the New York Times homepage. And you can see there's a really wide range that some articles, you know, basically are on for like one hour and disappear. Um, but you have other articles that stay on for, you know, two days or more. And uh, there's pretty much everything in between. There also seems to be this kind of cycle that a bunch of articles are taken off at um, uh, like 12 hours. And I think this is eight hours as well. But there's a wide range of, of how long these things stick around on the, on the homepage. Okay. Now, I mentioned from the beginning um, that... Um, we don't unfortunately have access to New York Times metrics, which would be really great. That's what we really want. So we're gonna have to use a stand-in for New York Times, which is the Twitter uh, API, uh, Twitter data. So we, along with everyone else, you guys all have access to the Twitter, basically the Twitter fire hose of, of data now, uh, as long as Elon Musk lets us have it. Um, this, you know, I think these next two bullets are, are pretty common or well known to people in the room here. Twitter is a very common social media source. It's a source that a lot of people use to get their news. I'll try to and, and also Twitter engagement or social media engagement can also lead people to consume more news um, um, is something people have found. Now, I'm going to come back later, at least very quickly, to show you there's a little bit of evidence suggesting mm -hmm. that the Twitter data is, is comparable to the New York Times data. Um, OK, and I, I wasn't sure if there was a question popping up. Um, OK, then let me let me keep going. Um, so. We what we do is we access from this Twitter API every tweet that mentions any of the New York Times articles that we have uh, in our database. So that's like 20 million tweets from 4 million users. And for each one of those tweets, we take the tweet and just like before, we score it on how positive or negative it is. The second thing we do is we figure out where people are located, which I'll show you in a second. And then finally, and you know, connected back to one of the goals of the paper is we figure out whether those tweets are relatively partisan, like pro-Democrat or not. So when you sign up for your Twitter account, you self, you can self-reveal your location. And we, you know, kind of parse through all that data and we figure out among people who are tweeting New York Times stories where are you located, what country, what state, if you're in the US, or what city, if you're in the US. And I just want to briefly show you, this is the, the states that people are located um, in our data on the left uh, map. And you can see that uh, this, the, the code is the darker is the state, the more Twitter users, you uh, more people tweeting about the New York Times. 
And you can see that <clears throat> the Twitter people who are tweeting New York Times stories are concentrated in large states, New York or California, and mainly urban uh, areas um, as, as well. It's uh, impossible to see in the map, but DC has a lot of um, has a lot of people tweeting New York Times stories. Now, the figure on the right shows you um, uh, a sample of what you want to think of as like Comscore data. This is another comparable source to Comscore called MRI Simmons. Among people who are visiting the NewYorkTimes.com webpage, what state are they coming from? And if you just you know very quickly compare these two maps, you'll see they look very, very similar. So basically people who are tweeting at New York Times stories, and at least from a sample, people visiting the New York Times they're coming from similar states. Um, so that's kind of a indirect piece of evidence that our Twitter data and uh, New York Times um, viewership are, are somewhat comparable. The other thing we, I mentioned I want to talk, we, we're going to use our Twitter data for is to measure partisanship. Now, we have some data on whether the users are partisan, but we're not going to talk about that in this draft. So I'm going to skip that for now. But what instead we're going to focus on is at the tweet level, is a tweet a relatively Democrat or Republican tweet? And the way we do this is a very standard machine learning approach. So we take a, a set of tweets from politicians, Democrats or Republicans, and we use this as training data. And we basically see, well, are, you know, what are the words that Democrat tweets are, are Democrat politicians are using in their tweets relative to the words that a Republican politician would use in their tweets? So again, you know, this is the, the common sense stuff like Democrats use pro-choice, Republicans use pro-life when they're talking about abortion, things like that. We use that mapping and we apply it to our set of our full set of tweets. And then we can use that to score each individual tweet that are, you know people are tweeting New York Times stories to figure out their part of the political slam of that tweet, where the scoring is one is very pro-Democrat and zero is not so Democrat. So we're going to be able to use that to, to look at you know, uh, what happens um, when headline changes? Do we see sort of a, a shift in more, more partisanship of, of, of tweets? So this table, which looks a lot like that earlier table I showed you, um, is a summary statistics now of the tweets of the New York Times story. So again, the last column is the um, overall set of data. And then the third, the three first columns are uh, the first two are uh, articles getting headline changes and then ones that don't get any headline change. The first two rows show you that among um, uh, the, the typical New York Times story gets about 300 tweets or about 17 per hour. But if we look at articles that get a headline change, either an A-B test or an immediate one, they're getting about twice as much action, uh, either in total or per hour. So articles that are getting headline changes are one where there's a lot of engagement, at least as viewed through, um, as viewed through, through tweets. The other thing we can see is that if we look at how many positive or negative tweets, again, this is the sentiment score where now we're, we're splitting up tweets to be either positive, negative, or, or neutral based on, um, based on our sentiment score, we're getting slightly more negative tweets. Uh, uh, sorry, we're getting articles that are having slightly more negative tweets are ones that get headline changes compared to the overall sample. Um, one interesting thing that we, we see, and we'll come back to this later on, is if we look at tweets that are relatively pro-Democrat overall, so, uh, you know, 10, uh, 10 per hour of the 17 tweets are uh, in the overall sample are, are pro-Democrat, we don't see among articles that get headline changes, we don't see uh, really very much more of that um, than we see in the overall sample. So what you want to think about is the ratio of this number, the tweet count, uh, that are pro-Democrat relative to the overall number. And this is pretty comparable for articles getting headline changes compared to the overall sample. Okay, uh, again, um, I'll ask, stop real quick to see if there's any questions, but since I have 10 minutes, I'd like to kind of get some results. Okay, so the two main sets of results are what drives headline, uh, which articles get headline changes, and um, secondly, what are the effect of those headline changes? So we have a, a kitchen sink specification, which is not particularly insightful. Um, but uh, so instead, I want to talk about um, uh, a little bit about the social media pressure 
as a as a source for which of the 20% of the headlines get get changes. So the idea that I mentioned was that um, perhaps newspapers or the New York Times responds to external pressure, uh, 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 important external source, say Jerome Powell tweeting about a, a, an article and saying, look, this headline isn't very good. Um, and there's an anecdote that talks a little bit about this in the text, but I'll skip that here. So as a practical matter, how do we do this to, to sort of measure this kind of external, or since we're looking at Twitter, social media pressure? So we do this in two steps. We collect all of the official New York Times Twitter accounts. These are either by authors, so like at Paul Krugman, uh, or all the official New York Times Twitter accounts, like at New York Times or at New York Times Business. Now, each one of those accounts, there's a bunch of people that follow them, something like you know, 10 million people are following Paul Krugman. That's not what we're interested in. Paul Krugman is followed by lots of people, say me, but what's more important is who does Paul Krugman actually follow? He follows like 100 people, and those are Jerome Powell or congressmen or important people. So we're going to focus particularly on the set of people or the set of accounts that he follows. And then for those accounts, or just in general, when people are, are tweeting all these articles, we want to look at how many tweets are there from people uh, about an article um, either by people that are following the New York Times or just in general, and then we'll classify them in our classification we talked about before, whether they're positive or negative or pro-Democrat. Um, I'll skip that there. So what are our results look like? So what we do in this table is this table shows you the number of, uh, the first two columns are immediate headline changes. Uh, articles getting, a, uh, is an indicator, does an article get an immediate headline change? And the next two articles are, does uh, an article get an A-B test? And this is all I should have said. We take our data, we group it into hourly intervals, and we're saying in this hour, does an article get an immediate headline change or an A-B test? And so what you want to focus on is the yellow, uh, the yellow shaded uh, areas, and that's for either immediate or A-B uh, articles getting an either immediate headline change or an A-B test. Those are, we're looking at tweets by people that the New York Times or the New York Times writers are following. So again, you want to think about these as influential people like congressmen or somebody like that. When, a, when one of those influential people mentions the New York Times story and mentions it in a negative fashion, that leads to more either immediate or um, A-B tests. Uh, for a headline. Now, when those same influential people either have something positive to say or are saying things in a relatively pro-Democrat way, that's not leading to much either economically or statistically significant effect on having those headline changes. Now, the second and fourth column are kind of a control for this, and they're saying, let's look at these same kind of tweets, like tweets in the previous hour, people, you know, tweeting about an article, um, but not, you know, restricting ourselves to important people, but just any old person like Coleman or Tommy tweeting about an article. And when we look at those general tweets, those things have like, if Tommy or me say, look, that headline was no good, you know, very, you know, we have something negative to say about those articles, that doesn't really lead to much of an effect. It leads to a little bit more A-B test, but not so much. Okay, so since I am you know, very short on time, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the impact of those headline changes and just maybe one, one or two things about the Wall Street Journal. So what we're gonna look at is we wanna look at various outcomes and primarily wanna think about like what, uh, we're gonna look at things like what's the effect on the number of tweets of having a headline change in a previous hour, okay? So that's gonna be kind of the main thing that we look at. now. There's an important, you know, econometric issue that I literally just showed you. It's not random which articles get headline changes. We could see, for example, articles that get um, uh, social media pressure are more likely to get headline changes. Or what I showed you in the summary statistics is headline uh, articles that are more popular or more likely to get headline changes. So we can't just run a, a, an OLS regression here. So we need to account for this correlation between 
headlines and the unobservable in our in our specification. So we have two different approaches, a propensity score match and an IV. I'll definitely just talk about the propensity score um, very briefly. Okay, so we're going to look at a regression that looks a little like this. We want to say, you know, what's the effect of having a headline change in the previous hour on some outcome of interest? Things like what's the effect on the number of tweets? So we're going to try to back out an average treatment effect. What would be the effect on this Y variable if we randomly selected among all of our New York Times stories, which one gets a headline change? And so very standard propensity score match approach. We take each headline that we know gets a headline change, our treatment group, and we match them with another article that does not get a headline change. So it's like a artificial control. It's like a, this whole thing is like a quasi experiment, experimental variation. And we use a bunch of observable variables to make this match. And these are some of these covariates we've talked about before, things like how long have they been on the homepage, um, how many tweets they are, et cetera. And there's a table in the paper that shows that the match quality is pretty good. So what I want to show you is this, uh, these tables here. So this is our, you know, what is the effect of these headline changes on, and so we're going to look at two different kinds of headline changes. So the effect of the immediate headline changes or the AB test. And each of these different columns show you the effect on different Y variables. That's what the, the column headers are. So it's like how many tweets you have, whether they're positive or negative tweets, or whether there's you know, relatively pro-Democrat partisan tweets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly go through these four columns. I'm going to focus on the immediate headline change uh, table because the A-B test one looked pretty similar. So the main, you know, the, 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 the dominant result that we see is that when there's a headline change after appropriately accounting for this um, econometric, the endogeneity of, of which articles get headline changes, we see that headline changes do lead to more tweets, which again, we're viewing as indicative of probably more reader engagement on the New York Times webpage, about 30 to 40% increase of its mean. Now, um, this is not a uniform effect and the paper parses this out a little bit about which articles see more of this boost. Now, we also see if we look at the second and third column that there's a, um, a little bit more like of that extra six tweets that we see more of them are, are negative than positive. Um, but um, so that's one, one other thing we see. But what I think is probably the other kind of important takeaway message is that of that extra tweeting we see when there's a headline change, most of that is not being driven by more pro-Democrat tweets. Okay, most of it's being, it, it, that's just not what we're seeing. So we're seeing more reader engagement but it's not this kind of core set of, you know, what, you know, the, the archetypal liberal East Coastal New York Times reader with their snarky tweets. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing more tweeting activity, but it's not it's not that very partisan kind of tweets. OK, so there's also, as I said, a bunch of results that reinforce these kinds of results using a second identification strategy with instrumental variables. And I'll, you know, uh, point you to the table to take a look at that. In the two minutes I believe I have remaining, I just want to very briefly mention a little bit about the Wall Street Journal. So you might say, okay, that's all well and good, Tommy and Coleman, but what about another source? So starting in the fall, we got our scraper, a new scraper together, and it started scraping the Wall Street Journal. And so for about four months, we have comparable data for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And we do the exact same kind of analysis. We want to ask, does the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, do they, does the Wall Street Journal also do these headline changes? And what's the effect of them? And let me just very quickly, I know there's, you know, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. I just want to very briefly show you one slide and maybe if I have a second, another one. So this table here is, remember I had that summary statistics slide that was like the first table I showed you. This is the same summary statistics slide for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for this more recent period. And so you can see the New York Times on the left, we have about 10,000 articles and about 7,000 Wall Street Journal articles. What you can see if we just focus on that last row is that about uh, a little over about 25% of the New York Times stories 
get a headline change. That's pretty comparable to what we were seeing before, which is, you know, that's good to know that the New York Times is relatively stable over time. What's what I think is pretty interesting, though, also is that the Wall Street Journal also does both A-B tests and immediate headline changes. Now, they rely a little bit more on A-B tests than uh, immediate headline changes, but the short end is the New York Times is not alone in doing this. Now, um, I, I literally have a minute left, and so I 100% know I shouldn't be showing any more tables. Suffice it to say, we what we do is we do the same kind of analysis that I showed you a, mo- a, a few minutes ago, and we say, well, what's the effect of these headline changes at both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? And what we see is, again, for both of these sources, when either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal changes headlines, that this leads to more user engagement in terms of more tweets, but we don't really see a big uptick, uptick in the partisanship uh, of, of those uh, tweets that are um, uh, among those articles getting headline changes. Okay, I know I'm at time. I'll just kind of leave this up here. What is my hope that this kind of rush presentation, you know, that you take away from it, Um, hopefully you have some confidence to say that we know that headline changes are something that are being done among at least, you know, the papers of records in the U.S., the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, most likely to other papers as well. It's being done primarily on these kind of high attention news articles. And it seems that most, you know, what's going on is most of these are being done to drive readers to these articles, and it's pretty successful at doing it, but it's not really a tool that's being used to lead to more partisanship in terms of user responses, which is um, at least my prior coming into this is that that was probably going to be a primary reason why these headline changes were being done. Okay, so um, that was a lot for 45 minutes, so um, I'm looking forward to questions you guys have. I know there's been a pretty active chat box, which I'm not, unfortunately, um, savvy enough to watch, but I know Tommy's been doing a good job at um, at dealing with those. Okay, so uh, any questions? And Tommy, hopefully we can unmute Tommy too so he can jump in and help answer uh, any questions. There's a, thanks a lot, uh, Coleman. That was uh, really super interesting. And so there was, yeah, uh, a lot of questions in the chat that Tommy uh uh, dealt with already. So I don't know if, if there's any other questions or comments that uh, people may have. Uh, just feel free to jump in. Okay, so Hannah says one, I think. Ah, okay. Great, thanks. So, thanks. So this is really fascinating. Um, and uh, so what I was, uh, what I was wondering if there's any way in your framework, if you if you if that would be interesting, and if you could look at the um, the distribution of attention to articles, so I'm thinking about so does this A/B testing and you know with uh, with profit maximization in mind, does this lead to I don't know first page headline or articles getting more attention and other articles you know being in a way left behind, or or do you so so could you look at uh, whether this A/B testing is done, you know, across a very wide distribution of articles, or just for certain types of articles? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. We in the paper we and I, I um, you know, in my very rushed presentation, I skipped over that. We we try to dig into this a little bit more, and it, it was exactly as you were saying. It's it's like the rich get richer kind of thing. The really popular stuff is really the stuff that's getting most of these most of these tests. Um, and, um, it would be interesting maybe to try to simulate a little, you know, how much, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is leading to concentration on more, you know, a, a smaller set of stories than we would see otherwise. And to maybe try to quantify that a bit more, but it seems it's mostly new stories and relatively popular stories is where most of this, most of this actions, uh, coming at. And Tom, I don't know if uh, if you, I don't know if I can unmute him or somebody can unmute Tommy, but I don't know if you have anything you want to add. No, no, I, I think you, yeah. You, okay, you, good. Oh. Okay, so Eileen, I guess has a question. I don't, oh, I don't know. Can I, I don't know if I'm, I'm the unmuter. Um, sorry, let's I, see. 
Oh, I sorry. Think I can unmute myself. Oh, Hi, great. Coleman. Okay, sorry. I'm not. I'm not super savvy with this. Hi, Coleman. Hi, Tommy. Hey. I really enjoyed this. I have three questions that are all sort of different. So, if it's okay, maybe I'll just ask one at a time. Sure. Um, then, if someone else wants to ask a question, you can kick me off. Um, but the first one is. Um, and sorry if I missed this in the presentation, is an immediate change really actually a clear conceptual category distinct from A-B testing? And I wonder in particular if they just use some kind of banded approach, um, and especially if they're in an organization where it's not about optimizing, it's about maybe more avoiding something catastrophic. That might just be, you know, the extreme cases where there's a really bad headline, and so they do their A-B testing really quickly. Yeah. Does it matter? I mean, maybe it, it doesn't even matter whether it's a clear distinction. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great um, that's a great point. Um, I um, the, let me let me try to address that in a couple ways. One is one of the weaknesses oops, we have right now is we don't have a lot to distinguish these two. Like, mo like I wanted to be able to say, well, immediate headlines do this and A B tests do that. So far, we don't have a lot. Like they both do the same thing. So I don't have a lot to say. We don't have a lot to say about that. Um, you're right. It could be the case. So there's these more, those of you who haven't, you know, aren't as engaged with this, there's more sophisticated versions of these kinds of testing you can do. You can test multiple headlines. You can start weighting more to one or the other. And I didn't, I definitely didn't um, spend any time talking about this because I ran out of time. The Wall Street Journal AB tests caused us troubles because they last less than a minute. Um, so we were running them and saying, oh, we don't see any A-B tests. And we had to uh, keep hammering it till we, till we actually finally found it. But just as an interesting aside, I am shocked we have never been banned by either of these two sources. Um, as getting ready for, one, for some of this presentation, I was in a hotel in New York and I downloaded 30, no, sorry. Yeah, something like 10,000 Wall Street Journal articles. And one would think that would lead you to be banned by them, but it, it apparently doesn't. So um, um, anyway, but yeah, um, we need to we need to think through a little bit more about the the differences between to what extent these are kind of artificial differences. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll combine my second and third question because yeah. um, I see other hands. Um, so I guess my question is two parts. So one is, is I think because I am a liberal coastal elite who grew up in New York City and is exactly like the anti-Trump demographic, um, I wonder if you're undercounting because I think when I obsessively click the New York Times all day, I always thought I see more than 20% of the headlines changing. Hmm. Um, so I wonder if you think there's any possibility you're undercounting. And then the related more philosophical question is what do we really learn from the liberal elite, New York Times, Twitter crowd anyway? Yeah, great. Um, well, I, I think I'm gonna make sure I'm understanding the first question right. Is it, um, you're thinking, you think there's more than 20% of these articles get headline changes. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder if I'm the only one who finds that my own personal experience suggests a higher number. Well, first of all, uh, let me give you kudos that you figured this out. like. Um, because in literally like one of the things I find just bizarre about this is as you know, as a, whatever, a New York times consumer, the New York times is very anal about talking about all the changes that they make at the bottom of the story and all that, but they don't, um, unless you catch it, you don't see that there's a headline change. One of the things I'll say is remember our sample is everything. So unless you're like, like if you're a news consumer, um, you're going to see more than 20%, unless you're like a style reader or all these other sections, like they're, they're, they're slow, they're lowering the, 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 the amount. So that's one, like, that's a possible answer to that. Now, in terms of like, yeah, like generalizability from the New York times, all I can say is I, I, I can, at least at this point say, I can generalize from the New York times to the, uh, the, we see the same thing in the Wall Street Journal. Now, I think the readership is not, the overlap is not great. There's definitely a decent amount of overlap. I 100% would love to like get a sample of a thousand newspapers, including like Winston-Salem Journal or whatever, some you know, local papers. It's not in the cards. Um, it takes us too long to, to you know, put the scrapers together. Um, I'll simply say, I think I'll leave this for a second paper. I would love, like, I'd love to do it. 
Um, I, as an aside, if you remember, I mentioned this company Chartbeat that has a lot of data. Um, they're, unfortunately, we went, if you've ever worked with companies, you know, we got to like step, we, we got to second base and then they threw us out and they're not interested in working with us, unfortunately. Um, but I, I wish they were. But you're right. Um, <clears throat> for now, we have to stick to, you know, what we can learn from the New York Times. And I guess that's a big caveat. I know if uh, Donald Trump was here, he would, he, would, he would have much else to say about what we can or can't learn from them. And uh, Tommy, I don't know if you want to anything, add anything. Uh, just one thing about going back to Eileen's first question. Uh, we, so that uh, in New York Times uh, API, they, they, is, uh, they categorize the articles into three things, hot news, feature feature news and opinion and uh, we do see more headline changes both ab and immediate changes in the hard news which you may see more often in uh, on the front page and uh, the feature news day there's less ab test or, or headline changes which you don't really see that often on the in, on the front front page <laughs> All right, so I think uh, Chris uh, has had his hand up for a while. Yeah, so thanks, Coleman. This is a really cool paper, and apologies for, for coming late. Maybe maybe you answered the question that I'm about to ask. Um, so I, I was wondering, really, um, you know, a little bit about the competitive dimension here. So, so does the New York Times change the headlines um, because... I don't know, the Wall Street Journal has changed the headlines. Mm. And what I'm thinking about is uh, Julia Cachet's paper that basically shows that they're very quick to uh, to copy content. Um, and, uh, and and I was thinking maybe maybe they're also very quick to copy, you know, the headline that works best on social media. Um, and, and whether you, you thought about that a bit. Um, short answer is we have not. That's a great, that is a great suggestion. Um, we've been too busy getting our scrapers to work to fully think through what we're doing. Um, that's a great idea. So at a minimum, we can try to pair these articles up between the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and see, is it like the same story that's getting these things? And, you know, is one lead, you know, does one move before the other? Um, it will be a real bear to do um, to match these up, but that's, um, that's on us, not not that. And I, I think that I think the the payoff would be pretty good. So I think that's a great suggestion. I think that's one that we'll um, uh, we should definitely look into. And again, Tommy, I don't know if you have any any other thoughts. Oh, uh, and if you can, I don't know the paper though that you referenced, or maybe I do, or maybe I do. Um, I'll send it in the chat. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. And Tommy, I don't know if you have any other um, thoughts. No, but yeah, it's a great suggestion though. I, yeah, we have to think about how to match the similar articles in the yeah. uh, New York Times. But yeah, that's, yeah, like uh, Coleman said, it's, it's on us. 